All righty. Tonight's class needs a very, very big disclaimer and a tremendous introduction. Tonight's Shir Be'ezat Hashem is going to touch upon a few incredible concepts of what's going on in the world today and how we find ourselves only a few days before one of the greatest days of the year, the day of Purim, the day that Yom Kippur is only Kippurim, and yet we can actually raise the heights of a Jew on this day greater than even the great day of Yom Kippur. So we need to really touch upon some very big ideas tonight. And at the same time, I want to say from the get-go, two big points. Number one, tonight's shiur is not any prediction. We are not into predictions. Tamim tiel Hashem elokecha. We go with Hashem. Everything Hashem that He does is perfect and is the best for Klal Yisrael. And there's nothing to talk about. The second point is that now we have this beautiful piece of Torah to go over tonight. I'd like to give the credit where the credit is due. The Mar Mekomot of tonight's share and many of the ideas of tonight's share comes from the author of the Sefer Magid Harakia, Mayidid Nafshi, Rabbi Gladstein. Hashem should bless him with Arichut Yami Mishanim. Should be Zocheh Bezat Hashem to continue to put out wonderful, wonderful shiurim to Klal Yisrael. This is something special. It's something that in my own words I want to share with you tonight. And I'm hoping that we'll be zochet tonight to hit on some incredible, incredible things. Specifically, what's going on in the world right now. Rabotai, did you ever think if we would only have the right eyeglasses to see behind the scenes of these incredible, incredible stories that took place once upon a time, we would find things that we never had a clue even existed. Let's talk a little bit about the story of Purim and let's go behind the scenes of the story. Let's, let's start talking about different pointers of the story of the Megillah and let's get a little bit of an insight of who were the messengers that were sent by Shamayim to be able to turn the tables around at different intervals of the story of Purim. And let me explain to you where I'm coming from. The Gemara Megillah tells us that when it came to that incredible moment that we all heard of, where Ahasuerus calls out to, es- to Vashti, to come out to show off her beauty. So the Megillah tells us she defied the king. She would not come. Why? Listen to these words. She had leprosy. But not only that. But we also learned in the Baraita, you want to know why she wouldn't come out and she defied the king? Because Ba Gavriel the Asala Zanav. The angel Gabriel, Gabriel, came down and put on her a tail. He literally pinned the tail on the donkey, okay? <laughs> he well, was starting with the Purim Torah already, and it's, it's only uh, 48 hours before, right? But nonetheless, Ba Gabriel, Gabriel came along, and he put a tail on Vashti. So if you ever wanted to know who pinned the tail on Vashti, the answer is the angel Gabriel. It's amazing. And this is a Gemara. Now, we're going to see that this angel Gavriel, he was kept very busy during the entire story of Purim from beginning to end. And every time something fascinating actually took place, sure enough, and there he was behind the scenes, sent by Borei Olam to take care of business at the moments we needed it most. I'll give you another example. So we spoke about the tail that was placed on Vashti. Yes, Gabriel. How about this? Did you know this? Haman is very busy building the wooden gallows because he already was celebrating 
that he's going to hang his arch enemy Mordechai HaYehudi on the gallows. So the Gemara tells us, where did he get the wood from? So the Midrash tells us he got it from the Teva. I'm not going there tonight. I'd like to tell you over the Yalkut. The Yalkut says that Haman got the wood from his Achsadra. Achsadra is the terminology that Gemara uses for a porch. So Haman had the wooden porch on the back of his house, like many good people do, and he decided wood better spent. It's probably like these days, wood went up incredibly, right? Very, very expensive. So he wanted to save on the wood, although he was one of the wealthiest men in the world at that time, but he wanted to save on the wood. So he went out to his back porch, his achsadra, says the Yalkut, and he took it apart and used the planks of wood instead to build the gallows. Mm -hmm. And then Haman says, you know, I got to size it up to the height of Mordechai to make sure that it fits his size perfectly so that he'll hang well. So he figured, Haman, that he is basically the same size and proportion of Mordechai. So he went up on the gallow to measure himself up against the wood to make sure that it's tall enough and properly fitted for Mordechai to hang. As he climbs up and is literally uh, measuring himself up against the wood, you know, with the chalk marks, right? And he's bringing down the rope and uh, basically sizing up the noose as he's fitting it on his own neck, says the Yalkut, who shows up? Malach Gabriel. Uh, and Gabriel says, and listen to these words. <laughs> Gabriel says to him, the Amar, listen to these words. Very nice. I'm happy that these, these gallows fit your size, Haman. How convenient. Wink, wink, double wink. Right? Right? Yeah. How convenient that the gallows fit you well. This tree is perfectly sized for you. It's actually like perfectly placed and prepared if, I don't know, uh, say, you would hang. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's, like, it's like it's literally made for you. Right? And sure enough, just as Gabriel told Haman that the gallows are a perfect fit to him, Immediately after that, says the Midrash, he went immediately off to his next job. And what was the angel Gabriel's next job? Viyarat etzel ahashverosh v'nadad shnato. From there, after he made sure the gallows were perfectly sized to Haman to be hung or hanged, he goes straight off to the castle to wake up the king and make sure that that night the king does not sleep all night long. And this is going to be the turning point of the whole story. The moment that the king can't sleep all night, and he instead spends his night looking through the Sefer HaZichronot, finding out that there was a Jew by the name of Mordechai that once saved his life, and he never repaid him in return. And that's going to be the moment that Ahasuerus is going to say, hey, we never paid this Jew for the good deed that he saved the king's life. I'm going to have to go now and have him literally march through the city on a white horse with kingly clothing. And I'm going to have Haman from all people lead him through. That's going to be the first step of the turning of the tables of the story of Purim. The Venahafochu begins to take form. And yet again, who's behind the scenes? Malach Gabriel. Right after he pinned the tail on Avashti, and then he went and sized up the gallows to make sure that it fits Haman's size perfectly, he goes off to the king and listen to what the Midrash says. The Midrash writes that the Malach Gabriel comes that night to Ahasuerosh, and not only does he wake him up and keep him up, but it says the following, he took his head, you have listening to this, Gabriel took the head of Ahasuerosh and banged it on the shayish. 
he slammed his head on the floor 366 times all night long just like just when the king started to fall asleep I don't know maybe that's the days of a leap year I don't know I don't know could be could be like this year yeah interesting but nonetheless every time the king started to fall back to sleep Gabriel would grab Ahasuerus, slam his head on the floor again and 366 times until Ahasuerus finally realized he's not sleeping tonight. <laughs> he's not sleeping tonight. And instead, there he was going through the Sefer HaZichronot until he stumbled on Mordechai HaYehudi, the one, the Jew that saved his life, who he never repaid. Wow. Gabriel was very uh, busy. Yeah in the story of Puri, right? And it's amazing. And, and, and literally, he's not done yet. Listen to this. Says the Gemara Megillah in Daf Tedvav, the Pasuk over there says in the Megillah, describing that when Ahasuerosh looked into the Sefer HaZichronot to see maybe there was somebody that did me a favor and I didn't repay, it says the Pasuk, Vayimatze, Vayimatze Katuv. Now, this says the Gemara, wait, Katuv? Katuv means, Katuv means writing. It should have said, Vimatse Katav, in past tense. And he found it was written in the past. What is this Vimatse Katuv? He found it writing. As if right now it's being written. It says the Gemara, Melamed, this is coming to tell you that Ashverosh had a scribe who was also an anti-Semite, Shamshai. And this Shamshai, he was mochek. He kept erasing and erasing the portion in the Sefer HaZichrono that talked about Mordechai the Jew. The Gabriel Kotev. And as many times as Shamshai would erase it, Gabriel would rewrite it again and again and again, so that on every page, every page that the king would open up to in the Sefer HaZichrono, there it is. It would be written all over again, freshly inked. That Mordechai saved the king's life and he was never repaid. And after the king kept turning and turning and on every page, the same thing was inscribed and written again and again and again, fresh ink, the king got the message. Maybe it was the 366 times his head was knocked into... Well, it could be. Some, certain people need different you know, yeah. okay, wake-up calls. But the bottom line is, the Matzeh Katuf. He found written again and again, just then, on every page, that Mordechai saved the king's life and he was never repaid. Till finally, Ahasuerus had no choice but to acquiesce. He gave in and he said, This is what I must act upon. I have to pay back Mordechai HaYehudi for saving the king's life after never showing him my appreciation. So this Gabriel was unbelievable. But if you think he's done, he's not done yet. He's not done yet. You know, it wasn't enough that he pinned the tail on, on Vashti and sized up Haman on the gallows and took Ahasuerus' head and knocked it in the ground and kept writing again and again in the Sefer HaZichronot about Mordechai saving the king. No, that wasn't enough. There's still more jobs. Still more jobs. What was the next job that Gabriel did when it came to the story of Purim? Well, very simple. The Targum in Esther says that as the king who was sitting in the private party with Esther and Haman. And she told him, finally, that she's a Jew. And that Haman Harasha Harzeh is coming to try to kill her and all the Jewish people. The king got all angry. The king didn't know what to do. So he went outside and he stood in his garden. And they were ripping up his garden. You know who's ripping up his garden, right? And the king got so angry. Who told you to do this? What do you mean? Haman said, after he throws you out and becomes king, he's going to get rid of this garden. So we might as well just do it right now. He said, what? That's what Haman told you? So the king comes back in in anger. And at that moment, as the king re-enters the castle, says the Targum, what does he see? Veha, I'm reading you the Targum now. You know what he sees? Veha, Gabriel Malacha, the angel Gabriel Dachaf Yat Haman Harsha, he pushed Haman onto the bed of the queen who was laying there, and that was the last straw. The king said, 
You're coming to be Kovesh, my Malka, right here in my home? Chutzpah? Right in front of me? And Haman says, no, 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 he pushed me. <laughs> Who? <laughs> exactly. So Gabriel was unbelievable. His role in this story of bringing down this incredible saga of Paras, the King Ashverosh, the evil Haman, he had a very dominant role. He was all over the place. He was the one behind the curtain, behind the scenes, sent by Borei Olam to do very uh, triggered and precise, Manutans. quiet little things that turned the entire Vinahafochu, turned the whole story around. Amazing. And that's Bemet, many Svanim, they count out how many different incredible things Gabriel did in this story, like we mentioned, whether it been the tale or the gallows, or waking up Ahasuerus, writing in the books, or pushing Haman on the bed of the queen, right when the king walks in. But Gabriel was an unbelievable, active angel in this story behind the scenes of the incredible Purim story. And here's something to think about. Why Gabriel? There are many angels. And I'd like to, I'd like to bring something to your attention. Gabriel is the angel of Gvura. He's the angel of judgment. Now, yes, granted, he is punishing the Goim in these stories, but he's also bringing out an incredible Yeshua. He's the one that God chose behind the scenes to be able to finally save the Jewish people. It's interesting. Usually we're saved by Michael, Sari Israel. Gabriel also comes, but he judges more than he saves. What was the connection between Malach Gabriel and the story of Purim? So Rabotai, I want you to really fasten your seatbelts because what you're about to hear now is going to put us in such a new light to what's going on right now in the world and to an incredible eye-opener for the coming week of only 48 hours away. Uh, you got to get ready for this. This is something off the charts. There's a very famous Gemara, Mesechet Avodah Zarah, Tavbet Amudbet. The Gemara says that when Mashiach comes, Hashem is going to take out a Sefer Torah and He's going to hold it up in the air, Kivyachol. And Hashem is going to say, whoever learnt this, whoever supported this, come and get your incredible reward. And at that moment, says the Gemara, all the Goyim, all the nations of the world, specifically the superpowers, they're going to come running. They're going to be knocking each other over in a human stampede just to jump in front of God, God and say, Me! We were the ones that everything we did, everything we did was for the sake that the Jewish people should learn Torah and we supported their Torah. And who is the first nation up to bat? The first nation that jumps and screams for reward? Rome. Rome comes in front of God and says, Borei Olam! Everything we did, we did for the sake of the Torah and the Jewish people. The bridges that we built was for the Jews to learn Torah. The marketplaces that we built for the Jews, Torah. Even the bathhouses that we built were just for the sake of the Jews to learn Torah. And we want, apropos reward, for everything we put out and everything we did. Hashem says, Tipshimatem. You guys are such fools. Who are you fooling? Everything you did, you did for your own self, your own self-interest, for your own good. You built the marketplaces to hide women of ill repute in the back alleyways. You built the bridges in order to collect your tolls, easy pays. You went and you, cut, you, you built these beautiful bathhouses, the Roman bathhouses, for your own indulgence. Don't you tell me that you did that for the Jewish people and for the Torah. Now this is an amazing Gemara. The Baalei Musar were known to ask. You know, Hashem calls them Tipshim. You guys are fools. He should have called them Shakranim. You guys are liars. You're a bunch of liars. You're making a claim that's completely false. No. You know why? 
because it's not false. In truth, in truth, all the ideas that came to the Goyim to go out and build infrastructure and do what they did for society was placed there by Hashem for the sake of Klal Yisrael. For the sake of the Jewish people to have that benefit to be able to teach and learn Torah. That's right. When they built the Verrazana Bridge, it was so that Rebbe's from Lakewood can drive over and come into Brooklyn and teach Torah at 6, 7, 8 o'clock in the morning. That's why these bridges were built. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Mr. Verrazano really thought that he was, or they were, building a bridge for the sake of easy pass. So Hashem says, Tipshimatem, you guys, you're right what you said, but you did it for the wrong reasons. So you're a bunch of fools, and therefore you have no rights to get any reward, because that's not the reason you did it for. Who are you fooling? Who are you fooling? And because of that, Hashem kishes Rome. Get out of here. Who's up, who's up the back next? Paras, the Persians. The Persians come up the bat next. And the Persians say, God, we built bathhouses. This is the same rhetoric. We built bridges. We built marketplaces. Hashem says, you guys don't learn, do you? Tipshimatem, you fools. Everything you did, you did for your own indulgence. You did for your own gain. You did not do it for the Jewish people. When the Parsim heard that, they kish. When all the other nations see that the two superpowers, Rome and Paras, were refuted and rebuked by God, everyone runs. Everyone realizes that they have no claim to the honor and the reward of Klal Yisrael's learning of Torah. But here, guys, this Gemara, so far, what we just spoke out, we all know. But let me tell you, at the end of the Gemara, there's a liner there that we don't want you to miss. The Gemara wants to know from all the nations of the world, how come these two nations were the ones that stood up and yelled and was toveya for their reward of Torah first? And the Gemara says, you want to know why these two nations? Because these two are the most chashuv of all the nations of Goyim. The Romans of Esav and Paras. Now this is very interesting. What is so special about these two nations? I understand in the world eye they're considered chashub. But what's so special about them? Says the Gemara, you want to know what's so special? Listen to this. The Hanach, Mashche b'malchutaihu ad da'ate meshicha. These two nations will be around all the way till the end of days until Mashiach comes. These are the two superpowers right before the coming of Mashiach. And who are they? Rome and Paras. Amazing. Now, to tell you the truth, Rome, I understand who Rome is. Rome is the West. And you know, we can get already a little bit here in the United States who the Rome of today is, the King of the West. I think we can figure that one out. But on the other hand, Paras, Persia, who's Persia today? Now I know you're going to tell me Iran, but in truth, that's not so simple. Matter of fact, the Maharal wants to know, Persia, Paras, was wiped out by Yavan right after the story of Purim. Right after Paras, they fall, and the Greeks took over. They became the superpower of the world, and that's why... The story of Hanukkah follows right after the story of Purim. Paras falls, Yavan rises. The Greeks beat the Persians, took over the power and superpower of the world. And that's how the story of Hanukkah came about. So the Persians have been gone for almost 2,000 years. So who today is the kingdom of Paras? So before we talk about this idea, I just want to tell you an amazing Gemara in Yoma. The Gemara says that, again... At the end of days, just like we spoke about, there's going to be those two great nations at the end, Paras and Rome. And says the Gemara and Yoma, Dafyud, they're going to fight against each other. Who's going to win? Who's going to, who's going to be the last standing nation? So Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi says, and this is the opinion of Rabbi Yochanan, that when Paras 
and Rome fight right before Mashiach comes at the end of days, says Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, Paras is going to wipe out Rome. Amazing. A little scary when you're in the United States, but all right, we'll hold that for a moment. But that's amazing. Comes Rav and he argues. And Rav says, no, the opposite. Says Rav, Rome is going to wipe out Paras. So we have a machloket here. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, Rabbi Yochanan, against Rav. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, Rabbi Yochanan says, Paras is going to wipe out Rome. The East is going to wipe out the West. That's what it sounds like. Whereas on the other hand, Rav says, no, Rome is going to wipe out Paras. They're going to be the last standing nation right before Mashiach comes. Now we need to know this because we all know that after that great final war of Gog and Magog, whoever the victor is going to be, whoever's going to win, at that point he's going to turn on Eretz Yisrael. He's going to turn back against Klal Yisrael and blame the entire war on the Jews, as they always do. And that's going to be the great moment of Ben David Avdecha, the great moment of Mashiach. So we want to know who's that last standing nation? Who is it that we need to keep an eye on that's supposed to be destined to turn back on Israel and Klal Yisrael right at the moment of the coming of Mashiach? And this is imminent. So we need to know our stuff. What's going on? Aha. So this is very interesting. Once upon a time, we gave this incredible class in the name of Ruchaim Kanievsky Shalita. Where Ruchaim Kanievsky actually decoded the different characters in the Chagadya. And this was a class that we gave before Pesach, the last few years, where all those different characters, he went through one at a time and explained and deciphered how each one symbolized another nation throughout the 2,000 years of Galut. And how Chad Gadya actually is a story about Klal Yisrael, who is the Gadya. We are the Gadya. The Zabin Abba, Abba's Boreolam, Betre Zuze, the Tre Zuze is the Luchot Abrit, the Torah. That's how he purchased us. That's how he acquired us through our, our Kabbalat Torah. So Abba, the Zabin Abba, Betrei Zuzei, he acquired us with the Luchot Abrit, the two Luchot, the Gadya, that's us. We're that, that kid. We're that little Shepsel. We're that Gadya. We're that little baby. Yeah. But then it goes on to tell us, but wait. But then came the cat, and then came the dog, and then came the stick, and then came the fire, and then came the water. And then came the cow, and then came the butcher, and then came the Malachamavet. Who are these people? Who are these people? Who's the dog? Who's the cat? Who's the water? Who's the fire? Who's the stick? Who are these people? Says Rukhaim Kanievsky Shalita. And we went through this in a magnificent class. And you can go back on the archives and find this class. Chad Gadya, according to the incredible revelation of Rukhaim Kanievsky, and he tells you exactly which nations are represented by these animals, or by these symbols. And he goes through the history of Klal Yisrael. Who was Bavel? Who was the Chaldeans? Who was Parasumadai? Who was Yavan? And he goes through every single one, showing how we went through each one of these characters as we went through the Galut of history. But the million dollar question is, bottom line, the last standing man, who's the Shochet? And who's the Malacham of it? That's the big question. And there's a big question. There is the Shochet Rome, and the Malacham of it is Paras, or vice versa. versa. Rabbi Chaim Kanievsky wanted to say that the Shochet is Rome, the West. Really? And he wanted to learn that Paras is, excuse me, that the Malacham of it is Yishmael, which is Paras, which he was learning as Iran. That's the way he was learning. And he was learning that the Malacham was going to kill the Shochet, which is a scary thought yeah. for an American Jew. But nonetheless, that was Reb Chaim's Mahalach that we did once upon a time. We're putting that Mahalach on the side tonight, and we're going with something completely new. The Mahalach of the Vilna Gaon. And this is something. So let's go back. 
At the end of days, our days, the final two nations, the two superpowers, the Gemara told us, is going to be who? Paras, Rome. These two nations are going to fight, and we have a machlok at Gemara, Yoma Daf Yud, who's going to win? Rabbi Shubhan Lei, Rabbi Yochanan says, Paras is going to win. Rav says, Rome's going to win. Amazing. Okay? So now, when we think about this for a minute, we're going to have to understand who is Paras today? We know who Rome is. By the way, just to put it out there, the Romans had a uh, symbol for their Roman Senate. It was the eagle. So the great eagle, which we today know the great eagle, the all-American icon. So we know who Rome is today. It even kept the icon of the very symbolism of Rome. The West. Today, the United States stands as the king of the West, the Rome of today's times. But who's Paras? So this is a big question, because they've been gone for 2,000 years. So let me share with you an amazing Gemara, and you hear this Gemara, I don't think you'll ever forget it. Rabbi Gladstein brings a Gemara in Yuma Daf Ayin Gimel, Ayin Zayin. And the Gemara tells us something amazing, really. Listen to this, guys. It says the Gemara that at the time of the Chorban, Bayit Rishon, Hashem sent down Malach Gavriel. And he told Gavriel, take the coals on top of the Aron Kodesh and the Kodesh HaKodeshim, Take those coals and throw them down on Jerusalem. And that will destroy Jerusalem completely. Malach Gavriel says the Gemara again. This is Yuma, Dafayin Zayin. He comes down. And he comes to the Kodesh HaKodashim. And he asks one of the cherubs, one of the Kruvim, can you pass me that coal? The cherub picks up the coal and hands it to Malach Gabriel. Now, being that Gabriel asked the Kruvim to pass him the gachelet, the coals, the minute the cherub picked up the gachelet, he cooled it off a little bit. And now that he handed it to Gabriel, now already it's cliché It's not mevashel as much as it originally had the power to. Gabriel takes this gachelet from the hand of the Kruvim and he goes up and throws it down on Yerushalayim. But being that the coal isn't as hot as it originally was, it does not destroy the entire Jerusalem, only destroys a portion of Jerusalem. And the rest of the Jerusalem still stands in ruins. The angels in heaven become incredibly angry at Gabriel. That's not what Hashem told you to do. Hashem didn't tell you to have one of the Kruvim pass you the coal. Hashem told you, take one of the coals and throw it down on Jerusalem and destroy her completely. You went and did your own thing, says the Gemara. They started giving the angel Gabriel Malkut. They gave him lashes with a fiery whip. They gave him fiery beatings. They flogged him because he changed God's word. And not only that, but then they threw him out They threw him out from the inner circles of angels in Shammai. He was basically kicked out of yeshiva of angels. <laughs> he was basically kicked out from the circle of angels. He's now mibachutz, he's outside. Wasn't allowed in. Excommunicated, as they say. The Malach Gabriel. Jerusalem is being destroyed. And now that Gabriel is kicked out and excommunicated, it opened up the place for a new angel to come in. 
Who is this new angel, says the Gemara, Yumada Fayin Zayin? His name is Dobi El. This angel was the angel, the archangel of Paras, of the Persians. Why is his name Dobi El? Again, this is Dobi El, not Dobi El. Please, don't, don't, don't. Don't, 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 don't even go there. This is Dobiel. Why is the archangel of Paras called Dobiel? So the Gemara and Kedushinayim Bet tells us that Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Yosef once said, you know which nation is Dumya to the bear? To the, the dove? Says Rabbi Yosef, Elu HaParsim. These are the Persians. You know why they're compared like a bear? They're... They eat and drink like bears. They're hairy like bears. They eat and drink like bears. They're, uh, uh, you know, somewhat overweight like bears. They're literally in the mannerisms of bears. And because of that, they're symbolized. Their symbol is the bear. So hence, what's the archangel of the nation of Paras? Do Biel. The bear angel. The bear angel. This is the angel that takes over Jerusalem at the time of the destruction. The angel of Paras, Do Biel. And he starts wreaking havoc in Jerusalem. And he starts literally not only turning the city upside down, but he starts hitting with horrible taxes and he starts doing things. Gabriel and Shamayim sees what's going on. Although excommunicated, he starts to cry out to Hashem, Hashem, help your children, help Jerusalem. In the merit of all the wives of great Talmidei Chachamim that are up late nights alone, taking care of their homes and their children as their husbands, are deeply immersed in Torah learning, where everything fell on them. And their zechut saved the Jewish people. But Hashem didn't listen. Then Gabriel says, Hashem, there is a man by the name of Daniel. Such a great Jew, Daniel. He's so great that if you would take all the righteous people of the entire world, if you would take all the righteous people of the Goim and put them on one side of the scale and you'd put Daniel on the other side of the scale, he would weigh out over all the righteous Goim in the world. If you have such a great Jew like that, isn't he enough to have a zechut to save the Jewish people from this Dobiel Malach, this bear Malach that's wreaking havoc in Jerusalem to destroy her? Just then the Gemara says, Hashem asks, I hear a voice. Who is that defending my children? Now guys, you need to know a clown. Bore Olam loves when you defend his children. Hashem loves when you defend his children. Who is that that's defending my children? All the angels point on the outside towards Gabriel who is excommunicated. He's the one. Hashem says, Gabriel, you are defending my children? Come back inside. He brings Gabriel back inside, and Gabriel was then dispatched to kick Dobiel out. And from that moment on, Gabriel and Dobiel became the battle of the Titans. These two together were always head to head, so to speak. And therefore, the nemesis of Israel was Dobiel, the angel of Paras. But Gabriel became the nemesis of Paras. And now you understand why. In the story of Purim, who is the angel that's behind the scenes, constantly turning the tables in the entire story to bring down the evil plot of the great Parsim, Ahashverosh, and Haman HaAmaleki? Who is the one behind the scenes to save us from Malchut Paras? Gabriel, because he became that angel, the defender of the Jewish people, specifically against Dobri, Dobiel and the, and the Parsim, which is an amazing thing. And that's what the Maharsha tells us. He says to us, 
This is why the angel of Paras is called Dobiel, because the Persians are compared to a dove, like we said earlier, and therefore the angel is the bear angel. And this is incredible. If this is the case, Rabotai, think about this for a moment. Who is Paras today? He's represented by the bear. Like the Gemara said, he eats like a bear, he drinks like a bear, the Persians. He's hairy, hairy like a bear, like the Persians. But they haven't been around for 2,000 years. After the Greeks came along and wiped them out, we have no idea who today is Paras. So you might think Paras is Iran, but that's not what the Vilna Gaon holds. Listen to this incredible Vilna Gaon Rabotai, and this is going to blow our minds of what's going on today in the world. Are you ready for this? I'm reading to you from the Sefer Ramosha Sturmbach, Shalita, who in the year 2014, when Russia attacked Crimea, Ramosha Sturmbach put out this incredible essay of a tradition that he has. You know, he is from the family of the Vilna Gaon. He's, I believe, a great, great, great grandchild of the Vilna Gaon. He has a tradition from the Vilna Gaon in the following. And this is actually found in the Likute Hagra. You'll find this under the topic of Gogu Magog. But listen to the way Rav Moshe Sternbach writes in his Sefer Tshuvot Vahan Hagot. Yes? This is amazing. He says the following. I'm going to read it to you inside so that you hear word for word where we're going. Says the Gaon, says Rav Moshe Sternbach. Hine la'aharona of recent times. Anachnu ro'im, we see the great Hitagabrut shall Russia ba'olam. We see how Russia is coming up in power in the world. Shekabshu et chatsi ha'i karim. That they just conquered that peninsula of Crimea. Umikubal meha vilna gaon. Guys, listen to this. And we have a tradition from the great vilna gaon. When Russia becomes a superpower and starts making trouble, as the Tuma in the world goes up as well. The Hizbir Hagra and explains the Vilna Gaon. What does that mean? That when Russia becomes a superpower and they start making trouble, Tuma starts becoming dominant in the world. What does that mean? The Hizbir Hagra. Sheklipat Russia. You want to know what the klipa of Russia is? He do be el. Wow, the archangel of Russia is the bear angel. The Russian bear, there it is. Sheyarshu klipat paras. Says the Gaon. You want to know who paras is today? Russia. The Russian bear. You want to know who the archangel is? Of Russia is Dobiel, the bear angel. And that is the icon of Russia, the Russian bear. He is Paras today, says the Gaon. They have in them, inside Russia, a mix of all different klipot, but the domineering representing klipa of Russia, not just the Christianity that's amongst them. Not just the others, they have all different, they have Arabs in Russia, they have Christians in Russia, but the domineering klipa that rules and represents Russia is Paras, says the Gaon. Represented by the Malach Dobiel, the bear. So here we go. Paras versus Rome. The bears versus the eagles. You hear that, Mark? Who are you putting money on? Yeah. The Chicago Bears or the Philadelphia Eagles? You know, okay, whatever. But you have the Bears. This is what it's coming down to, says the Gaon. You have Paras, who's Russia, versus Rome, the Eagles, which seems to be the United States. And we're getting there. We're absolutely getting there. And if this is the case, Rabotai, this is amazing. 
There's not just Ramosha Sternbach. There are quite a few Svarim. I heard this past Shabbat, someone was giving a Sheur, and he was saying over, and the grandfather of Musafi, who also said to his students that Paras today, people think it's Iran. Yeah. But he said, no, it's Russia. And he says, they're represented by the Klippa of Paras, and their angel is Dobiel, the bear, the Russian bear versus the American eagle. And this is the final showdown. This is brought as well in the Sefer Dametal Tamar, as the way Rabbi Gladstein brings it, who he says specifically in the name of the Vilna Gaon as well, that today's Paras is Russia. And you're thinking to yourself, okay, Rabbi, that's amazing. But you know, what does that have to do with right now and this time of year? And we are 48 hours away from Purim. I thought you'd never ask. If that wasn't enough, now you really got to put on the seatbelts. This is one of those shiurim that just doesn't stop pounding. It's great. Listen to this. Open your hearts. Again, we're not here to make predictions. Torahi v'lilmoda nitzarich. We want to go through the sugi together and just watch at the amazing plan of Borea Olam bringing us a geulah to Klal Yisrael. Listen to this unbelievable concept. People think that the systematic killing machine to kill out Jews was invented by the Germans and Hitler. Yimach mm -hmm. They're wrong. Hitler and the Germans were not the first one that came up with the systematic killing machine to wipe out Jews, the final solution. You know who was really the first one who came up with that concept? Stalin. Who? Stalin. Stalin. Russia, Stalin, communism, Stalin. Stalin was going to carry out Karl Marx's communist dream. It's funny how Marx was a Jew, but we won't talk about that. But Stalin was going to be the prince of communism. Stalin was a butcher. He murdered over 20 million of his own people. Yeah, he, was a, he was a triple Hitler. But he had a different style. You know, there's a great connection between Stalin and Hitler and Ahasuerus and Haman. An incredible relationship. Where really, they both hated Jews equally. And one wanted to do the job, but when he found somebody else so eager to get his hands dirty, he said, great, you want to do it for me? Keep your money, says Ahasuerus to Haman. I don't need your money. You can keep it. Just go out there and wipe them out. Because I want it as much as you do. The Gemara tells us the famous mashal to describe Haman and Ahasuerus. One had a hole and the other one had dirt. They needed each other because they both were united in the same final solution. To wipe out the Jewish people. Ahasuerus, Ahasuerus wanted it as much as Haman did. Ahasuerus says, hey, if you want to do it, my pleasure. I want it as much as you do. And that was exactly the relationship between Stalin and Hitler. I'm not going into the Kabbalah. There is a concept that Stalin was uh, Ahasuerus and Haman was uh, Hitler. I, I don't want to go into that. It's not my plays. It's not my, uh, I'm not schooled in those areas. Yeah, we're not doing predictions. We're not doing Gilgulim tonight. We're not doing any of that tonight. It's not my area, not my expertise. But I will tell you, something's amazing. And you're not, you need to catch this. So Stalin was the first one to create the systematic killing machine of Jews. In 1920, he already wanted to begin the final solution to get rid of all the Jews, not just in Russia, but in all of Europe. Not just six million. He had a much bigger number that he was after, even more than the Holocaust. He believed, Stalin believed, that the Jews was the biggest hurdle, the biggest impediment to his communism dream. And if he can get rid of the Jews, he can reach his communism goals, communistic goals. He felt we're the ones that, the only ones that can shut him down. And because of that, get rid of the Jews, 
and he can have the communism. And because of that, he wanted us terribly. And he even made a plan, and he started building work camps in Siberia. Anyone who knows a little bit about the stories of the Gedolim in Russia, how many Gedolim went to Siberia? How many Jewish children were ripped away from their parents and sent off to Russian work camps? The Stipler Gaon was sent off to military camps, the famous story with the coats in sub-degree, sub-zero weather that he wouldn't put on as a watchman in the middle of the night because he had a chash that maybe the coat was made out of shatnez. Amazing. Stalin already built it. He built the final solution. He built the labor camps in Siberia. He built the death camps. He was going to uh, exterminate one third. He was going to send to the labor camps one third. And he was going to expel one third. He had it all mapped out. He had it all ready to go. And he started the process in 1920. But then Hitler came up on the scenes. Not too long after. And Stalin realized that, hey, Ahasuerus says to Haman, you want to do the job? By all, means. By all means, keep the money and do what you need to do. You're only helping me. And at that point, the Holocaust came along. After that, a miracle took place. Listen to this. Right after the Holocaust, in 1948, Russia was one of the first countries to actually, the United Nations, vote and back the Jewish state of Israel. Now, you would think for a minute, now, where did that come from? And this guy hated us as much as Hitler. Both of them. This guy, Ashverosh, this guy, Hamam. <laughs> Terrible. And yet, it's amazing. When it came time to vote for the state of Israel, Russia was from the first countries to endorse and vote for the state of Israel, 1948, in the UN as a state. That's amazing. How did that come about? It's a miracle. Mom, it's an open miracle. How did that come about? There was a communist party in Israel that was made up of many famous names of people that I don't want to say on camera because people are going to take this the wrong way. Mm. But names that you know, very famous uh, people that had a hand in starting the State of Israel that was part of the Communist Party that still had ties after World War II back to Russia because at that time Russia was also threatened by Hitler because of the dominance that Hitler wanted to take over the world. So because they were allies with the United States and later on they liberated the camps, the Communist Party in Israel had ties back to Russia and at that time, Stalin believed that Israel was going to be a communist state. A communist state. So now he says, hey, I thought the Jews were going to be standing in the way of communism, and yet they're about to inaugurate a state that's going to be a satellite communist state of Russia. It was exactly the story of Ahasuerus. It's amazing. Ahasuerus hated the Jews because he thought we wanted to build the Bet HaMikdash in order to overthrow his kingdom. He thought we were danger to his kingdom, to his power. We were threatening to him. Later on, little did he know that when he saw in the Kishuf that the next king after him is going to be a Jew, it's not that the Jews are overthrowing him, but rather the son he's going to have with Esther, who by law is a Jewish Daryavesh, is his own son, his own heir. Exactly the same thing happened with Stalin. He thought we were against communism. So he wanted to kill us because he thought we were trying to overthrow him. Later on, the state of Israel comes along, Daryavesh, well, not exactly, but the state of Israel comes along, and we find out at that point, hey, they're not against communism. The Communist Party in Israel is very strong. So they voted for the state of Israel as one of the first. But then years after that, he realized that Israel moved away from being a communist state and instead became a 
socialist state. And he said, oh, they backstabbed me. Now I'm going to pick up on the old work and finish it, the final solution, in 1953. Stalin came up with a devious, diabolical plan to wipe out the Jews and finish the job that Hitler started. And whoever survived Hitler in Europe and Russia, he was coming after to wipe out. And the name of this plan was the Mishpat Harofim. He came up with these trumped up charges against these group of Jewish doctors, false charges. And he was going to bring them up to a high court. And he was going to make this a big propaganda. He was going to use this to market the idea of how terrible Jews are. And he was going to come up with these horrible charges against these Jewish doctors to make them look like horrible, inhumane people. To give that stereotype stigma to all Jews so that the people of Russia and Europe would turn on the Jews wherever they're at and start over again on the old pogroms and start again wiping out Jews till they finally accomplish the final solution. And it was a week before the Mishpat Harofim. It was Shabbat, February 28th. 1953, Erev Purim, Shabbat. And there in a Siberian camp, there was a rabbi by the name of Rabbi Yitzchak Zilber. And he was there with a group of Jews. And that Shabbat, he was talking to them. And he was going through with them the amazing and incredible things that were going on in the world at that time. And they started talking about how bleak times look. And how again they're in Siberia. And how again they're under the Russian rule of hatred. And how Stalin is bringing up charges to these Jewish doctors. And if has shalom, this case goes bad, it could be danger for all the Jews in Russia and in Europe. It could even be expulsion. They could be expelled. They could be murdered. They could be killed. And Rabbi Yisrael Zilber looks at them and says, my friends, do you know what today is? Mm. Today is Erev Puri, Shabbat. That day was February 28th, 1953. And he turned to them and he said to them, Tonight is Puri. Tonight is the night of Vinahafochu. And no different than the story of Purim, how Hashem saved us. If Hashem saved us then, He could save us now again. That night, February 28th, 1953, the night of Purim, that night... Stalin had a stroke and he died. The great Russian bear was dead. And the next week, Mishpat Harofim, due to the fact that he was the one driving the trumped up charges of falsehood, dropped. And all the Jews of Russia and all the leftover Jews of Europe were saved again. This is amazing. Paras, which the Gaon tells us is Russia. The first time Paras fell was the story of Purim. That means that the first time that Paras fell was on Purim. The second time Paras fell, Stalin, the Russian bear, who was coming to the final solution again to wipe out Jews. And when did he fall in 1953? on Purim. That's the second time that Russia fell on Purim. And here we are. We're looking again at what might end up being the great showdown between the great Russian bear and the American eagle. And we're down to the last moments of Paras and Rome. And we're a few days away from the great day of Purim. And you know, like they say in English, three is a charm. Brilliant. Paras, they fell the first time, Purim. Stalin, Paras, the Russian bear fell the second time on Purim. And right now, Paras, Russia is at war. Maybe with the world. And we're going to see what Purim this year holds. But one thing I tell you, Rabotai, this Purim 
we need to use for Kalal Yisrael's Geula. If there was ever a time that there were so many blatant, open, incredible simanim and signs, it's now. This is the time, Rabbi listen to me. We need a lot of Rachmanut. We have no idea what we're going to open up in the news tomorrow. We have no idea where this is going. Only Borei Olam knows. We're relying on Hashem. We're in Hashem's arms like an infant in his mother's hands. We're completely relying on no one else. We're relying only on Borei Olam. Not the bear and not the eagle. Neither one for Klal Yisrael can do anything for that matter. We need Abba. We need Borei Olam. And therefore, I urge you, I urge you, we need Yeshua. Every family needs a Yeshua. Every family in Klal Yisrael today needs a Yeshua. My Rebbe told me, and I told you this again last time, that incredible story that happened in a town not too far away from here of a group of Tamidei Chachamim, 11, 12 guys, who each guy had tremendous tzarot going on in his home. And they reached out and asked, what can we do? And they were advised that Lel Purim, the night of Purim, to come together as a minyan, and each one together to say the entire book of Tehillim, not to split it up, each guy together in a minyan, Say the whole book of Tehillim and ask for an incredible bakasha. And those bakashot are not returned empty-handed. We did it two years ago. After we heard this story. Because we heard that right after that, these incredible Talmidei Chachamim called back Israel and said, in a very short matter of time, every one of them saw Yeshuot. Everyone! We did it last year, we did it two years ago. We start Bezat Hashem this year, Wednesday night, at 10.15, maybe 10.30, we're still figuring it out. Between 10.15 and 10.30, Wednesday night, we're going to be saying, and the minyan, the entire book of the Tehillim, will be finished at two and three quarter hour later. We open up the Aron, we say the Mizmor le David, Tefillah le Parnassah with the Kavanot, mm. and then we say Nishmat Kol Chai after midnight. And then we do a Rikida. Wow. Mm-hmm. We do a Rikida of Mashiach. I'm telling you. We do the Rikida. We do the dance of, of Mashiach, Rabotai. We do the dance of the Geula. We're waiting this year. This is the year that we need to be Marbe, Bitfilot, Bitachanonim, Ubitzdaka. This is what's going to get us. What is a person supposed to do to be saved from who knows what's coming? The Gemara Sanhedrin says, it's only Yasok ba Torah ugmilut chasadim. Our esek of Torah is what we learn here in the morning. We give up our esek, our businesses, to learn Torah in business hours from 9 to 11. But we also need gmilut chasadim. We need tremendous tzedakah. I want to give you a phone number. I have specific almanot and yitomim, specific Aniim of great Talmidei Chachamim that I know personally that have big families and they have no way of making a Purim Pesach, forget about it. We're going to be giving out the monies to them. I want to give you a phone number. You can go and click on this number. The number is 518-323-0376. One more time. 518 518- 323-0376. And then it's going to ask you for which campaign are you giving towards? And the number is 625. So let's just say that one more time because some people are watching live. So you might not get to repeat this again. So we'll say it again. You got the pen? That one doesn't work, right? All right, so throw it away. Get another one. You got this one works? Okay. 518-323. 0376 campaign 625 625 give with an open heart 
give matanot lebyonim, we will give it out to mehudar, the best people who desperately need, who I know personally. We'll give it out this Pesach, al manot and yitomim, who need desperately. But one thing's for sure. Right now, we need rachmanut desperately. We're about to watch what's about to happen. The bears against the eagles. Bore olam, we're waiting to be taken home. Al kanfe nisharim. Thank you for listening.